Good morning from Washington, D.C., and to those of you in the room, welcome to the Wilson Center. I'm Lauren Reese, and together with my colleagues in, at the Wilson Center, it's my privilege to welcome you to today's event on the changing geopolitics of critical minerals and the future of the clean energy transition. Today's event was developed in partnership with Jojo Nam Singh under a research project he's leading in, with support from the European Research Council. It's a real pleasure to have you here in DC, Jojo. If you've been tuning into our events on critical minerals, you know that, that Jojo's uh, been providing a lot of expertise. Uh, for those of you joining the Wilson Center for the first time, I'll share a quick word about us. The Wilson Center is a think tank based in Washington, DC, mandated by the US Congress to bridge policy, practice, and research. The center is home to about 15 programs that focus on different regions or topics, including our Africa, Asia, Global Europe, and Latin American programs, our Polar Institute, our China Environment Forum, and the Wabit Institute for Strategic Competition, all of which are co-sponsoring today's event. Together, we cover every corner of the globe and today's most pressing issues. The program I direct, the Environmental Change and Security Program, or ECSP, works to connect issues at the intersection of environment, natural resources, population, and security to foreign policy and international development. Climate change and responses to it are reshaping our world, everything from where we live to how we transport people and commodities to how, we, how and where we produce energy. Ensuring that our responses to climate change lay the groundwork for a more just and equitable future that no one is left behind in the global energy transition is a core focus of ECSP. Laying the groundwork, laying the groundwork for that cleaner, more equitable future requires working across traditionally siloed sectors and industries. And it also requires recognizing and managing the trade-offs that are inherent in such a significant shift. Critical minerals are a key component of the renewable energy transition. They are also a key component in our modern day digital economy, in our defense systems, in manufacturing, and in infrastructure, and in information and communications technology. We'll hear more from our panelists, Corey, uh, Corey Combs and Jojo on the specifics regarding critical minerals. But I want to underscore at the start of our discussion that although this event has a focus on the renewable energy transition, that transition is not happening in a vacuum. There's a whole host of diverse industries and actors vying for access to these minerals. And so a key question that must be addressed is how policies and investments can mediate those diverse interests. Today's event builds on a series of events that we hosted over the last year in partnership with Kim Thompson and her colleagues at the US Agency for International Development and as part of the Transatlantic Climate Bridge, which is led by Adelphi in Berlin. If you haven't already done so, I encourage you to tune into the recording or read the summaries of those events, as well as a policy brief co-authored by Wilson Center Global Fellow Sharon Burke and my ECSP colleague, Claire Doyle, who has been helping to lead our efforts on minerals. Um, you can find links to those resources at the bottom of the event page if you're watching online. And for those of you in the audience, we can help you find those after the event. Uh, you know, in those events, we looked at the opportunities and risks to mining, what better looks like when it comes to mining, processing, and consuming critical minerals, recognizing that there are legitimate concerns among environmental and human rights ad advocates regarding the impact of mining on vulnerable landscapes and communities. And we've looked at how leaders on both sides of the Atlantic are responding to projected demand and the role of transatlantic cooperation in harnessing opportunities. If you've been following the topic of critical minerals, you know that this is a rapidly evolving space, and we'll hear more on that from our expert panel. But this issue didn't actually sneak up on us. Um, in fact, about uh, more than a decade ago, in the room just one floor down from where we're sitting now, um, we had a panel event that highlighted the dependence of renewable energy technologies on critical minerals and underscored the point that the extraction of these minerals primarily takes place in vulnerable communities around the world where labor rights and environmental protections are lacking. One of the speakers, Cleo Pascal, noted that China had been very active in securing minerals for a long time, centering it as part of their general st uh, strategic security. She warned that the difference between the strategic perspective of, and of the US and China was creating an uneven playing field. So here we are nearly 13 years later, the playing field has grown even more uneven and the issue has become more urgent, partially because of the compounding effects of supply chain disruptions over the last few years, partially because of our complicated relationship with China, and partially for a lot of other reasons, not least of which is the urgency of climate change. Not quite overnight, but close to it, uh, critical minerals have, have become a national security priority in the US. 
the obvious lesson from this is, of course, that you should all pay very close attention to our expert panel today um, and take action. But it also points to the tensions inherent in policymaking between addressing short-term crises and building long-term resilience. Right now, a lot of the discourse regarding the U.S. and China leans antagonistic, but in the context of climate change, cooperation is key. The U.S. and China are the world's two largest emitters of greenhouse gases and key actors in providing the tools necessary to support a global energy transition. And neither country can do it alone. And that's not to say that a little competition can't inspire innovation, but it can't be a zero-sum game. So today we've brought together this expert panel to provide an examination of the challenges, policy options, and strategic diplomatic alliances needed to minimize confrontation and maximize cooperation in critical mineral supply chains. We're going to start with brief remarks from each of our panelists. I've encouraged them to keep this as conversational as possible so they can chime in with their own questions for each other and, and uh, comments in response to each other's remarks. We'll reserve a good amount of time for Q&A in the second half of the panel, so please be prepared to ask your questions. For those of you in the room, we'll have uh, mics available, so if you raise your hand, I'll direct a mic to you. Uh, for those of you watching online, you can enter your questions in the chat box below the live stream video, and you can do that at any point in the discussion. Uh, we're going to hear first from Corey Combs. Corey is an associate director at Beijing, Beijing based Trivium China, a policy research and strategic advisory company that provides analysis on China's political economy. Corey covers China's climate, natural resource, and industrial policies and advises governments and institutions and multinationals on China's strategic planning and avenues for engagement. Following Corey, we'll hear from Jojo Nam Singh, a global fellow here at the Wilson Center and an assistant professor of international development at the International Institute of Social Studies, part of the Erasmus University, Rotterdam. Jojo is the principal investigator of a European Research Council five-year research project titled Green Industrial Policy in the Age of Rare Metals, a trans-regional comparison of growth strategies in rare earths mining. Grip arm is much easier to say. Um, <laughs> we're very pleased to be welcoming Helena back to Helena Matza back to the Wilson Center. Helena's been a standout leader on the issue of critical minerals within USG. She was previously the Director of Energy Transformation in the Bureau of Energy Resources at the State Department, where she led strategic engagement on clean energy and power sector issues, including the Mineral Security Partnership. She's now the Deputy Special Coordinator for the Partnership on Global Infrastructure Investment. And finally, we'll hear from one of my star colleagues here at the Wilson Center, Jennifer Turner. <laughs> Jennifer directs our China Environment Forum. She's long been a go-to resource in D.C. for anyone trying to make sense of the U.S.-China environmental cooperation as well as climate and governance issues in China. Okay, so let's start. <laughs> uh, Corey, when we uh, spoke in preparation for this panel, you said that part of your job is taking policy silos and trying to understand the policy market feedback loops. So can you start by walking us through the significance of critical minerals? We know it's not just about getting the materials out of the ground, it's about where they're processed and how they're processed. Um, can you talk about you know, what's driving the sharp spikes in demand and, and who some of the stakeholders are? Well, thank you so much, and thank you everyone for being here. Uh, 9 a.m. on a Thursday, I know everyone's top topic of mind is mineral resources. Uh, <laughs> so again, I want to say thank you very much for being here. Um, you know, the nature of global resource competition is changing and, and quite rapidly. It's evolving quite rapidly at that. Um, I think there are two sides to really being able to unpack these issues. First is, what exactly, and I don't mean to be too philosophical about, but what are we talking about when we talk about critical minerals? And it turns out that, quite naturally, it depends who you ask. I'm going to focus in my comments on the U.S., EU, and China as three of the major economies driving a lot of the more competitive, hopefully not conflictual, ends of uh, global resource competition at, right, at this stage. Um, Within that, uh, we can then separate out you know, how those different lists uh, reflect the different interests and importantly, the structural drivers of this competition. We need to be able to understand um, not just the status quo today, but what are the structural forces driving the shape of this competition moving forward? Because those forces will, uh, are the only means we have to anticipate what comes next and hopefully to shape it in a mutually beneficial direction. Um, so there's a lot of embedded questions in what you've asked. I'll try to give uh, in about six or seven minutes, we'll see how well I do, um, as, as broad uh, an overview as I can, um, largely to tee up um, more details from those panelists. Um, at a high level, you know, you asked, why do we care about these minerals? And we'll dive into what minerals and what are the drivers of the competition. The long and short is critical minerals cover many of the world's most, government's most strategic objectives, the highest priority objectives today. 
Um, the one that's nearest and dearest to my heart, of course, is the low carbon uh, transition, uh, green energy, uh, climate transformation, however you want to put it, um, mitigation, adaptation, both. Perhaps one of the top of mind ones is the battery minerals, you know, lithium, cobalt, graphite, uh, nickel, that sort of thing, um, essential to batteries. Uh, of course, for decarbonization transportation, also energy storage. You cannot have a renewable grid without storage, and largely battery-powered storage. Meanwhile, you have rare earths that go into everything from permanent magnets, essential to motors, um, to uh, very particular uh, niche metals that are essential to the U.S.'s defense industry. And as soon as you say the word defense, you can imagine the political and economic interests uh, in, those, in those materials. Um, meanwhile, you have much more purely uh, economic interests. I'm going to look at China in particular, um, both at a national, provincial, and even local levels. You have a variety of stakeholders that view this set of minerals, which again, we'll discuss the details of exactly what they look like, viewing this as an opportunity for a new development model. You know, at a national level, China has been the world's factory for a long time. It's kind of a cliche uh, you know, to summarize it that way, but essentially that's the, the basic idea of the growth model. That is changing, and it must change for a few reasons. One is economic sustainability, another is environmental sustainability, another is political legitimacy. You know, Xi Jinping has uh, committed China uh, personally to peaking emissions before 2030 and reaching carbon neutrality uh, before 2060, which humble eyes of a climate analyst, you might say, is not fast enough. And at the same time, it's the most ambitious uh, transformation of any major economy in the world. And that is going to require a huge amount of critical minerals. Another piece I would highlight here is, again, the upstream, midstream, and downstream for all of this. As much as the pure set of minerals is itself complicated, the ecosystem is further complicated, not only by the different stakeholders with different interests. Right? The, the, you know, the chip makers and the auto companies have very different interests from the aerospace and defense industries versus the medical suppliers. They're all involved in this. Meanwhile, you have the upstream extraction, which is largely happening, as noted, in um, particularly developing countries. Uh, de uh, countries that are looking for development opportunities, but that also run the risk of new era resource curse uh, issues. So there's that side of it. Then you have the midstream processing. Right? You, you, get, you get a bunch of materials out of the ground. You get a, a brine or you get a, a chunk of rock that has 30 different things in it. You need to make that into something that's industrially useful. Right now, as, as many in the U.S. are, are you know, acutely aware, China dominates the processing of many, if not most, not all, but most of the um, uh, raw materials, particularly those of interest to the United States. Um, that is, on one hand, you know, a supply chain diversification issue. You know, one of the big things I would, uh, parallels I would draw is this is not oil and gas, which, you know, you have crude oil, a huge set of, a very, a very concise uh, set of sources, but a, you need huge production volumes to go into everything. Critical minerals are a hugely diverse range of very different materials that you need in relatively small quantities comparatively, and they also go into everything. Why does that matter? It means you cannot have economies of scale of the same type as you have in some of the more traditional industries, and hence why it's possible for a particular country or countries to dominate this. Um, but it's hard for the entire world to get involved in processing just on a volume uh, basis. So anyway, I'd like to open to the first slide, if, uh, if I can. I just put it up. It up. Great. <laughs> so um, back to the central question of what critical minerals are we talking about? I'm not going to talk through every one of them, but I'd like to draw a couple things. There are three different lists. There are many, many more lists. Japan, Korea, others have their own lists, of course. Um, but I'd like to focus on three, US, EU, and China. There are, in total, 59 different minerals uh, addressed over the course of these three lists. There's a lot of overlap, You know, roughly a third on this list. Um, are elements and, and minerals that appear in all three of these uh, regions' uh, lists of critical materials, uh, I'll call them. But a lot of others are very unique to the particular industrial structures and requirements and strategic interests of those blocks. Right? So, so for example, you see bauxite, which is from which you drive alumina, for aluminum, uh, it's only in the EU. Why is that? Well, China has plenty of it, major producer of aluminum. The EU has a particular alumina interest trying to compete. And that scarcity drives uh, political interest, political need, and strategic interest in securing that. Hence, it's on the EU list and not the others. Things like that. So really, when you see this, what I'd like to draw attention to is it's a huge set, but it's a policy roadmap. It's not just a collection of minerals that some geologists thought was important. This is an economic analysis of, one, what's important for our industry today, two, what is important for the industry we want to build tomorrow. This is quite directly a roadmap for what various uh, governments 
will try to pursue. And in fact, I saw yesterday Reuters had obtained uh, the EU has a critical um, strategic minerals uh, act. Uh, I'm going to get the name wrong, apologies. But it's coming out on the 14th, I believe. So this is very directly being translated into policy even as we speak. I'll note the US has perhaps the longest list of 50 separate minerals. Uh, the EU says it's 30, but if you break out you know, platinum metal, uh, platinum group metals and the rare earths, there are 49 different elements on its list. China has 37. You can see the overlap. And on the right side is just a selection. I wanted to pull out a few because I know the left is just a big old list and you can look at that at your leisure later on. But it's worth highlighting a few specific ones of interest. In the center there, you see a lot of the battery on the right side in that Venn diagram. These are the different lists from the US, uh, US EU, and China. Um, and again, they have different names. We'll talk about that later if you're interested. Uh, but at the center is basically most of your battery materials and a lot of things that go into contemporary uh, steel and other alloy uh, industries alloy-based industries. Um, on the far side, you see China with copper, electronics industry. What is the US electronics industry compared to China's? Right? That's where you're seeing these uh, diversions uh, or uh, differentiations. So again, if you ask where are things headed, the first step is where are policy hi uh, makers highlighted where they need to go? I'd like to focus now on the second piece briefly. This is much quicker, I promise. What are the structural drivers moving forward? They vary, uh, of course, but without a nuanced understanding of each particular region, and then within each region, the particular set of domestic stakeholders and, and, uh, and drivers, we cannot hope to understand the trajectory moving forward. So I'll give a very high level one minute, not doing justice to any particular country, but to give a baseline. Um, for China, as noted, they want, uh, you know, policymakers in Beijing want a new, greener, lower carbon, uh, higher value add uh, economy. It is not about producing low-grade steel, hopefully, in 10 years. It's about NEV batteries, of course, is already happening. What about green steel, green aluminum? What about high-tech uh, uh, materials and higher-end chips, for example? Something we see in the CHIPS Act as, as a point of competition uh, and tension right now. Um, there's that side. There's the political side mentioned with climate as well. Um, but again, you also have these very local drivers, right? You have small town, smaller towns, at least small by Chinese standards, in otherwise uh, very um, wealthy Guangdong province who are saying, hey, we missed out on the batteries boom. We want other opportunities. Maybe we can get processing. Maybe we can produce wind turbines, which rely on critical minerals. And we're seeing that happen right now. We're seeing those economies built out at a local scale, fairly independently of the national scale. So it's important to understand that. In the EU, there's a lot of concern over China taking over some of the higher end production that the EU has typically had, uh, aluminum as an example. Um, but again, there's, the, there's another side, the environmental side, alluded to uh, earlier in Lauren's comments. Um, the EU is not particularly keen on opening new mining operations in its own territory. How do you deal with that trade-off? If you don't want dependence on other countries, depending on who they are, um, can you build the processing? Or are you willing to make that trade-off and bring mining into your um, particular regions. In the US, why does supply, I'm gonna put this very bluntly, why, why does supply chain dependence matter? We're dependent on all kinds of countries for all kinds of things. I think fundamentally, uh, this is, the supply chain issue becomes so important for the US because there is a belief uh, that China could take serious economic action. And for China's part, the similar concern exists. You know, China is dependent on Australia, a US ally and Five Eyes member, for a large portion of its lithium. Despite the US uh, you know, focusing on the uh, Chinese dominance of lithium processing, China is meanwhile very concerned saying, a US ally is controlling a good portion of our lithium um, uh, raw supply. It does not feel secure in that. The producers and suppliers um, of the pr processed minerals do not feel secure in this. But it's much the same on the US side. The US government does not feel secure, obviously, in having these massive dependencies. Because what if, the, if, if China, for example, institutes some economic trade control or trade controls or other economic measures? Right? That's not a secure position to be in. But ultimately, I call that a political issue because if there were trust, it would be a different story. And of course, we don't live in that world. Right? So how do we put on guardrails? And something I think we can talk about later. It's, those are just a few. You have the economic, the climate, the political, the local development, environmental, and finally, we cannot separate out the profit motive. The biggest driver of this, even in China, and I think there's some misconception about the role of many of these companies involved in the space, the relationship of, of state-owned enterprises versus private enterprises in China, something else we might discuss in comments later, or questions if anyone's interested. Um, private sector uh, companies are the main drivers. 
in most of the future-facing industries, all the battery minerals. Right? You have BYD, China's largest car market, uh, sorry, a car producer in the world's largest EV market, going to Chile privately to secure lithium supplies for its, for its batteries upstream. Beijing is not particularly involved in that. Certainly involved in many other things, but not that. I think it's notable. So when we look at how we ended up in the status quo and where we're moving, a lot of the U.S. issue right now is that there was not enough of a profit motive uh, for certain types of industries to be held in U.S. soil. That has moved. Chinese policymakers helped move things in a certain direction, and then private companies have since taken up the reins and taken those opportunities. Um, so do not neglect the role of profit uh, uh, in, in driving the shape of this competition. That can be harnessed in certain ways through policy. Other ways it's much more difficult, especially depending on the type of industrial policy or lack thereof you have. So I'll pause there, um, but there's a lot more to discuss here, but I hope that gives a sense of framing of where we're at now and some of the key drivers that are shaping competition moving forward. Thank, Thank you, Corey. We'll come back to you in just a few minutes. Um, but first to Jojo, mm -hmm. I, you know, you've been sort of deep in this sort of interface of the industrial policy and environmental governance and the geopolitics of producing and consuming countries in the context of your project. So I wonder if you could sort of reflect on, on some of Corey's comments and bring in some of the key takeaways that you've seen over the last few years. Yeah. Okay. First, thank you for the invitation. It's a privilege to be speaking with all of you here. Um, maybe we'll put up the first slide. Um, so this is a really good snapshot of how complex supply chain resilience is. Um, <clears throat> when you start looking at this, I don't think China-U.S. geopolitical competition is the first thing you're going to think about, right? If you look at the downstream segments, you have multiple countries, both allies of China and U.S., participating there. Um, you see all the developing countries in the upstream segment, and in the midstream is a combination of South Korea, Japan, so mainly East Asian industrialized countries, China, and then some EU countries. So if we take this snapshot, Critical minerals are, is, are basically linked to complex clean energy technologies that, that span different kinds of um, uh, goods, you know, advanced manufacturing, low carbon technologies, medical devices. But also what this figure really tells you is that we are seeing a supply chain where at different stages of production and processing, it incorporates different countries, different firms, into this very complex web of, um, suppl uh, of suppliers and consumers. And so I think where I'm getting at is geopolitical perspectives help policymakers in terms of framing what is the EU, what is the US, what's the Japanese interest. It kind of gives the public an idea of where we might go forward in terms of policy. But it doesn't really get us to the complexity, meaning at the, on the ground, how do firms secure these resources, right? How do we unpack the levels of interdependencies and dependencies? Because they're basically linked together. Just an example, um, we're all worried about 95, 97% of rare earth elements being controlled by the Chinese. But there's also a huge issue of illegal mining in rare earth elements, which the Chinese policymakers are concerned with. And that's not necessarily going to be solved by taking a geopolitical perspective on the issue. Um, what we're saying here also is if, let's say, it's 95 percent, you know, maybe 90 percent if we're going to be very generous, that means over the medium and long term, we need multiple levels of cooperation, multiple avenues in which we are going to engage with the producing countries, with the firms who will be selling this in the market. And so I think I do echo the point of Okori around we shouldn't underestimate the commercial objectives around why firms do what they do in the rare earth industry, in the critical market space. The second point I want to make is on figure two, which is I want to highlight one point that we often forget, which is mineral producers will play a very big role in the clean energy transition. So in this, this is a uh, basically a graph that was produced by one of the EU Commission reports. In the raw material stage, you can see the dominant role of China, Africa, and Latin America. Then there's limited processing when you go to the process material stage. So there, there, there's a little bit for Latin America. Fairly clear um, dominant role for China, and um, the EU is also there. So 
as you move down to the components and the assembly lines, they virtually disappear. And that is reflective of how we view supply chain resilience. We basically forget how mineral producers are going to play a role if they keep, you know, if they put in place certain policies that would impact in the medium and long term the supply chain. So what we're basically seeing here is that mineral producers will have specific interest and that's going to be articulated in policies so we're you know firms are often scared about resource nationalism as a very risky strategy for uh you know well for f basically for securing resources um but we've already got a history in which you know certain types of minerals have been subject to different types of ownership structures and that means we have to deal with these problems we you know with these policy changes and so we need to understand why countries you know, nationalize the resource, in what form, and what kind of opportunities are open. So one important point to make is when someone talks about resource nationalism, what the Brazilians mean, mean is entirely different from what the Bolivians mean when they talk about resource nationalization. If countries have state-owned enterprises like Brazil, uh, uh, Chile, you know, the copper, uh, the copper sector with Codelco, they'll have a different engagement strategy with the private sector, and therefore we need a different policy approach to these countries and to these um, specific minerals. So ultimately, I think the, the issue here is we need to get to the point where we have to understand what mineral producers want in order for them to gain, you know, um, strategic advantage in this increasing demand for critical minerals. We know they want value-added processing. They want refining plants to be set up in their own countries. We need to figure out in terms of strategy, in terms of industrial policy, what is acceptable, you know, what is the acceptable risk for us to be able to engage with these mineral producers. Because what we don't want to happen is a disruption of the supply chain to the extent that we're really not sure whether we're going to be able to produce the wind turbines, you know, the electric vehicle cars that we f that, that's being set up as the, the, the energy transition strategy for Europe and for the U.S. I think the last point I want to make is, which I'm sure will come out, is the question around recycling. Um, because if it's really, if we're really at the point where critical minerals are scarce and we don't know where we're going to get them if we're not getting them from China, is recycling the answer? Um, in some contexts, particularly, in, so in our project, we do a lot of research looking at the European Union, Japan, and Korea. The EU has the most advanced strategy in terms of investment, R&D investment, research, etc. when it comes to recycling. So the idea of the circular economy, the circular strategy. Um, I think we shouldn't interpret that as a strategy to necessarily replace primary raw materials, the primary supply chain, because there's still not enough studies that have shown we're at the stage where we will develop the technology to be able to fully replace the demand for critical minerals. So in most of the studies, they often point out that, yes, we can develop technologies for recycling, um, but it's not going to respond and it will not substantially contribute to the global, RE, uh, global supply chain you know, the global security, uh, global security for, uh, so global supply security. Um, what this means in practice is we need to reflect on, you know, how to manage the demand. We need to reflect on the need to develop recycling technologies and infrastructure, but without, you know, forgetting that the primary problem is we have in the medium term an issue of supply and uh, supply chain resilience. So we still need to extract we still need new mining projects in the next five, 10 years in order for us to meet our clean energy targets. Thank you, Jojo. Helena, you've been sort of working overtime on these issues. Um, and I know that, uh, I read that John Podesta was you know, speaking at Sierra Week, is it Sarah or Sierra Week? I don't know, in Houston on, um, and he said that you know what we're trying to do in the US is reset our policies on critical minerals so that we have the security of supplies. Uh, can you speak to some of the legislation that's come out recently and, and sort of where we're headed and how, how you see the different pieces of legislation fitting together for that sort of overall um, effort in security of supplies? Sure, happy to do that. And it is Sarah Week, which I just came from as well. <laughs> um, so it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting conference where 
actually what you what we've been talking about in that conference where all of the energy community comes together has shifted so much in the last three years. I think last year we were walking into that conversation, discussing the initial themes on the geopolitics of the energy transition, talking about what it's like to emerge from the COVID crisis, how to deal with supply chain constraints, and then response to, at that point, uh, the beginning of Russia's invasion in Ukraine and the implications across the energy sector of, especially for Europe, but really the whole global community of an over-reliance on Russian gas and, and a real interest to make sure that we get it right as we move into doubling down on this transition. This year, we had folks like John Podesta, John Kerry, and many others um, able to really start laying out our vision. Um, some of that I'll share here. And I always like to start my, my narrative from my own reflection, uh, being at the White House on the National Security Council climate and energy team on day one of this administration. Um, we started really under most of that paradigm, not quite the Russia piece yet, but all these other elements and a strong desire to come back very strong on climate action. And in those first week, week and a half, uh, our president released two executive orders that really dro drove the path for what became a, a suite of really important legislation that has been guiding our work to date. Uh, so on day three, we announced the executive order on tackling the climate crisis at home and abroad, which really set the tone and tenor for how we wanted to come back on our climate action, releasing a new NDC, and then, of course, all of the work that we wanted to do in the international community. We also released, maybe a week after that, an executive order on securing America's supply chains. And it's the nexus of those two important key economic policy goals that has really driven so much of the work that we've um, been really running full steam ahead on for the last uh, two years at this point. Um, and there's a lot of enthusiasm in the US system, and I would say like a healthy bit of optimism as well, because this really is one of the most transformative moments since the Industrial Revolution. However, this is now happening at a time where global economies have never been more integrated, and so we need to figure out the mechanics of what Corey really laid out, and I hope we talk about it a little bit more as the conversation moves on, um, a supply chain that's very different than traditional commodities. We're talking about commodities. Some of these materials that we're focusing on aren't even really traded quite yet, right? And um, it's not just about smelting and refining. Most, and many of these require like solvent chemical processes. So you have you know, a whole community of policymakers really trying to understand the implications, the types of people that we need as part of our community to really inject um, the, the capital, the right policy and support to get this work done. So um, what have we done? Uh, we've really moved forward with a couple truly transformative pieces of legislation. Um, Sometimes I tell this in order, other times I just like to tell it in, in you know, how, how kind of big and bold uh, our commitments are. I think on the climate action theme, our ability and commitment to moving forward with the IRA has been an incredibly transformative opportunity for our economy. We're talking about injecting almost $370 billion into our economy across so many elements of the future leaning economy and the clean energy sector. Um, you know, for, for 10 years, there, there will be nothing more transformative in our capabilities. At the same time, we move forward with the CHIPS Act, which is, you know, $52 billion. So talking about a different but really important supply chain and manufacturing capability on semiconductors and chips. And of course, really the first piece of legislation that really got us kicked off just the bipartisan infrastructure law, which sometimes we just glaze over, but was an incredibly large infusion into our efforts, first focusing on EV um, uh, uh, charging station and infrastructure, but also putting forward $9 billion for 14 different critical mineral streams, whether that's focusing on um, our ability to start supporting R&D on recycling and actually going and being able to, to revisit tailings and be able to, to do advanced processes to get rare earths and, and other elements out of, out of uh, those, those existing tailings. Um, and we already released $2.8 billion based on that legislation and grants all across the mining production and processing supply chain. Um, and so this is one of the 
most kind of comprehensive uh, moments I have ever seen in my you know almost 15 years of, of covering versions of this policy area first from the climate perspective mm -hmm. then the clean energy perspective and now from a much broader global infrastructure view um, so there's a lot happening at home and we're seeing every day the private sector responding to um, this very thoughtful full fulsome policy with new offtake announcements being I don't know, made every day, our commitments that the president made on EV sales and the, the percentage that we want to see by 2030 being met by almost every auto maker in, in the U.S. And in fact, it's even hard to keep up with all of the new partnerships that are, that are being created on the backs of, I think, very strong policy action. Now, that said, um, I take care of our international relationship and connect that back home. And so I'll, I'll just leave this as a teaser, but even though we are completely dedicated to ensuring that we do everything we can to um, kickstart our economy and be a leader in this, in this space. I mean, I say this space, I mean the broader energy transformation space, the broader um, semiconductor manufacturing space. We understand that we can't do it alone. So while there are challenges in the current supply chain, and I think JoJo did a good job showing where there's some over-concentration, some fears of over-reliance, um, and a huge role for producing countries outside of the U.S. market. Um, we need partnerships to be able to tackle those challenges, to ensure that we're not just securing these materials for our market, because no one wins if there's just two epicenters for batteries and EVs, the U.S. and, and, and the China market. There's the rest of the world and really important policy and support and demand um, in the European markets, Japanese markets, you name it. And so very early on, to couple this really important work, we committed to a handful of international efforts to demonstrate that we're working with our partners. So I now get to represent our Partnership for Global Infrastructure Investment, which is the President's premier G7 Plus initiative to support transformative infrastructure investments around the world. So we're looking at clean energy supply chains end to end. How can we support the cleanest, greenest mineral extraction around the world while at the same time making sure solar is deployed in markets, including ours, but everywhere else as well. Um, we had a really early, wonderful spin-off of those efforts with the Mineral Security Partnership, which I had the pleasure to, to manage for the first year of its, of its um, origination that brings together 12 countries and the EU to work together on near commercial investment opportunities in the critical mineral processing, or I should say production processing um, sectors and is moving forward with, with great success. And so I'm sure we'll delve into those initiatives as well as the conversation goes on. But I think that's a, a good lay down, at least to get us started on uh, the handful of the major U.S. policy initiatives that we're moving forward to, to, to start tackling this issue. Thank you, Helena. Jennifer, <laughs> you've, been, uh, you've been tracking sort of U.S. US China environmental uh, partnership and, and competition on uh, on a whole host of issues for decades. Um, front row seat. Front row seat, <laughs> as well as China's domestic and foreign policy strategies when it comes to natural resources. Um, I wonder if you could just comment on how today tracks with where we've been um, and maybe just reflect on some of the other speakers' remarks. <laughs> I love that when we were organizing, they said, Jennifer, we'll tie it all together. I don't know. I, I mean, <laughs> your questions are going to help us tie it all together. But yes. so start off like, you know, my project, I've been here 23 years, and um, so much of my work has been looking at U.S.-China competition and cooperation around energy, environment, climate issues. And um, I have to reflect on, I don't know how many of you read, back, back in 2002, I was, still, I was here, but still my nerdy grad school side loved this. Um, David Lampton wrote that book, Same Bed, Different Dream, about <laughs> U.S.-China cooperation, Tong Chuan, Imong. It's a great expression in Chinese. And I use it a lot when I give talks, because it's true on so many levels. I mean, we are united, and I like thinking about the earth, the climate, that's our bed. We are together. And we had, used to have very different dreams and visions, but during the Obama administration, we seemed to have at least gov to gov, like, wow, we were in the same bed and same dream. Maybe. But, uh, but <laughs> and, I, and, I, and, and, and now, of course, the situation seems, you know, that in thinking about com, com, um, critical minerals, can we cooperate? Can we minimize conflict? And when we're looking at U.S.-China gov to gov, it, things are 
I'll be diplomatic, a little sensitive right now. But I think it's important to note that this, this bed where we had the same dream, it wasn't just the governments. Well before the Obama administration, U.S. foundations, NGOs, think tanks, universities, the state of California and other states had been working with Chinese counterparts on a lot of clean energy issues, a lot of major U.S. NGOs. They have offices in China. And they have been building the capacity on the Chinese side in terms of getting, you know, helping them move on their own clean energy um, transition. Um, I also like to, let's point, let's, since we're talking EVs, let's talk about California. I mean, to you, you know what I'm going to talk about, that Chinese experts and policymakers they didn't just go to Southern California because it's cool, but they were talking to, you know, uh, talking to a lot of, of the state of California on um, their zero emission vehicle program early on to try to understand, well, what were the kind of policies that California did that helped drive new energy vehicles? I don't want to say they photocopied it, but they definitely learned the lessons. And, and so that, that the, and this is also when the U.S. and China were working together under the Obama administration, make it clear. We weren't giving the Chinese money. It was a lot of it was on regulations. China was seen as a laboratory for a lot of clean energy technologies. They move fast, not always right, but they do move fast on things. And so um, I think that, so it's kind of interesting now that we're talking about batteries and, and when the fact that the fact that it's thriving so much. I mean, Xi Jinping, what was that, a year and a half ago where he said, yeah, 2030, 2035, we're not gonna make internal combustion engines anymore. That was a, that was a global game changer, but that also kind of enabled the environment that we're seeing today, and it's exciting. I mean, I mean, I'm excited that the Biden administration, that we're, you know, pun, accelerate on the gas <laughs> to get these electric vehicles going. And it's, and, and the demand is great, that neither the US nor China can, can, you know, supply the complete demand for the world, but we're gonna try, right? And, uh, and so, th so there is that kind of competitive element, race, in terms of EVs. Um, I wanna just make another quick, we can talk more about the beds and things like that in U.S.-China relationship, <laughs> but but again, but but there's a lot of people in this bed, and 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 we're talking about one last little quick comment that you know geostrategic. You had your map with all these little or is it still there? Oh, not there, but, but all those little flags. There's a lot of players here, and so we need a bigger bed, right? And that and that there has to be the kind of collaboration, and it's not just gov to gov. And oh, should mention the business community as well. Um, in terms of, I want to just touch on, and I know that you know. You, we talked about recycling beforehand, <laughs> that it's true, recycling of, of solar PV panels and a lot of these other items that contain the, the critical minerals, it's not gonna supply, uh, fix the supply problem, but environmentalists are looking at this, this is a catastrophe in the making. I mean, in China, they've been the number one investor and installer of solar PV panels for decade plus. And so, and the numbers they're saying that by 2025, they're gonna start seeing end of life for solar PV panels go whoop. So the need is now. And China's very concerned about waste issues. Um, you guys remember in 2018 when, you, when China closed the door to us shipping our recyclables to their country? It was because they were having their own municipal solid waste problems. They have nowhere to put the waste. And so they, they've been reorienting their whole recycling to do kind of, to create domestic supply chains for waste recycling and um, you know, mandating that cities have to come up with ways to make this happen. And it's still a work in progress. But so they're very concerned about waste because they don't have the landfill space. They already have serious problems with soil and water contamination from their rapid development by being the world's factory. So the Chinese, you know, they're, in some ways when I was reading, um, you know, I, I went and reread the, the White House, you know, you're building resilient supply chains. And there, and there was stuff in there about the recycling and how we're also investing and, and trying to figure out what to do with it. What, you know, we're going to need laws. We're going to, EPA is going to have to have the capacity to help. You know, this is also about creating markets. But remember, when we're talking about recycling, good news, this isn't U.S. China hitting at loggerheads. We both need it. So I'll, I'll pause there for now. I could ramble on on other things, but just that you'll see that I think it'll be interesting that as, we're, as we dig into the critical mineral space about where there are opportunities, where there is common interests that aren't all the battles you guys are talking about. Okay, that's it for now. I'll talk more about green governance later if there's questions. Thanks, Jennifer. We can always count on you for some good puns <laughs> and <laughs> book titles. <laughs> um, Corey, can I come back to yeah. you real quick? Jennifer <laughs> mentioned the sort of the subnational efforts um, and the role that they've played historically. 
but also thinking about sort of the, the domestic polities or some, or some national politics and the, um, the politics that are driving sort of different interests within the U.S. and China. And I wonder if from your position you can comment on how that's playing a role as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, and again, it, it's... I usually would break this kind of thing up into the social, political, and economic realms, and usually at least two of those are connected. But they can also become fragmented in interesting ways. And so I'll talk a little bit about that, that means concretely. First sub-national thing I'd like to point out is, you know, punchline um, decoupling is not easy, <laughs> you know, and, and including in this space. I mean, look at, let's take batteries, for example. Um, Goshen, a uh, Chinese company based in California now, but Chinese company investing in what, nearly a $2 billion plant in Michigan. That's huge for Michigan. It's huge for employment. Uh, for employment, pardon me. Um, CATL is a major provider to Tesla, and now Ford has a has a partnership with CATL, leading Chinese battery maker. Uh, most of the EU major auto companies have JVs, joint ventures, um, with Chinese companies uh, to produce in China, and increasingly, they're, it's the world's biggest market for a lot of the EVs, EVs being the direct trajectory that most of the European car companies are moving. That's where they're getting a lot of the revenue. I think uh, a certain car company in particular got, uh, a German car company, got half of its revenue uh, from China in the last mm -hmm. year. Um, that's, that's not something you undo very easily. And so I think that subnational business tie level is, is huge. Uh, and of course, that ties in, as noted, to in the case of uh, Germany, for example, there's a huge political interest. Germany is you know, the industrial powerhouse. It wants to maintain leadership in the auto space. It does not want BYD to replace, uh, you know, it wants fair competition, but it doesn't want to lose out on the next generation vehicle space, right? And same is true in the US, of course. Um, meanwhile, you have uh, the ties, the Goshen plant is just one example of many. Um, that's a direct labor. That's, that's a pure social benefit. Meanwhile, at the, the much more national geostrategic level, which might not, it might be, you know, dinner politics conversation, but probably not people's day-to-day -day work conversation um, about dependence. You know, do you want to, what kind of trade-offs do you want to make in terms of the business and social and other and environmental aspects? And I think that's, there are tensions between the kind of the national level, uh, of course, policymakers at national levels in all countries and regions are fully aware of this, right? but there are additional considerations on top of the subnational. And it's, it's a tension there that I think is causing a lot of the ambiguity, is just how will certain policymakers, um, will China start trying to direct the private companies in a way that um, you know, focuses on economically you know, outcompeting or outmaneuvering the US? And there is a, a very direct perception that the US and to some extent the EU are working to contain in some specific fashions China's growth, uh, whether the narrative is accurate or not, that's the perception, and it is a driver of policy. Um, meanwhile, there are political perceptions of Chinese behavior that, you know, are in understandable, that might be disputed by Chinese policymakers, but they're real as policy drivers based on perception in the United States. Then you have this kind of political feedback loop as well, where, you know, quite frankly, you know, both political parties in the U.S. Uh, have a strong political incentive to demonstrate strength or toughness on China. Where does that lead us policy-wise? Well, it leads in a very clear direction. That is not necessarily the same as, you know, let's make a trade agreement on batteries or something like that. Um, and so there are those different considerations. Um, I think in many ways, the kind of business and labor and other connections, there are a lot of them that are very productive and helpful for moving these forward. Um, but yeah, I, um, there's, there's more to say on that, but I'll pause. Okay, Sorry. thank you, Corey. Jojo or Helena or Jennifer, do you, any of you want to chime in on that before I move on to my next question? Yeah, I, you know, as, as you were speaking, I think you, uh, <laughs> you, you all knew I was going to, yeah. <laughs> um, as you were speaking, I was just, I was reflecting, and I, I think I would kind of organize those buckets in a really similar way. Um, I think when we think about competition in this space, the U.S. perspective has and always will be that fair, open, transparent competition is good for all economies, including our own. Um, as we're looking at this particular supply chain, it's very easy to make parallels about what's happened with PV solar panels over the last 10 years. So you're talking about a market that had its learning curve, you know, decrease costs by 80% in less than five years. And now we're having the same exact thing happen with EV batteries. And there's very clear policies that helped drive that change. But now as we are trying to invigorate the solar market, we're learning that there are a lot of constraints and capability to actually source and develop new solar manufacturing that 
it is not easy to match the polysilicon producers with the ingot wafer makers with right the ultimate project developers. And that's because of a lot of different issues, um, including how so much of the PV market ended up being incredibly over-concentrated. And what we've learned in the last two years is a lot of that's been on the backs of forced labor used in that market, on um, really high emission coal production, driving the development of those panels. And now we're trying to kind of demystify and, and figure out how to open up that supply chain. And of course, Chinese firms are responding to that, moving their operations and, and diversifying as well. Um, but it's, it's that thinking that you have to bring into a conversation around EVs and batteries also. Because at the end of the day, you want to see this market operate in a way that we're going to be able to meet the goals that we have for every economy, ours included, to be able to deploy as fast and quickly as possible with sourcing challenges beyond just making that parallel of like really challenging mismatches, right? It takes almost 17 years to site a new mining project, maybe three to five years to build a, uh, a, a battery production facility, plus all of that good stuff we've been alluding to in the middle that's like pretty advanced chemistry, right? <laughs> uh, and so there's, there's a lot that needs to happen at the same time. These markets are plenty big and there's a lot that can happen. But as you're thinking about kind of those buckets that you laid out, those are kind of some of the thoughts that come to mind of like, how do we mitigate against the challenges but open up this market and diversify it to, to the best of our abilities with the right policy levers, but always to bring in the private sector to respond. Thanks, Lena. Jojo, did you want to make any comments? If not, I have a question for you. Okay. <laughs> no, no, I think I'll leave it. Okay. All right. I, I wanted to ask, um, you know, we've been thinking about how sort of the geopolitical space is influencing critical minerals supply chains, but if we flip that and think about if there's an opportunity in, in the policies and investments we uh, drive forward in the critical mineral space, is there an, an, a potential to sort of influence some of those bigger relationships, those broader relationships? I wonder if you've seen any of that in the, the work that you're doing with the project. I think it's good to come back to the point about disentangling interdependencies and dependencies. Because if we know we're going to need suppliers from China, suppliers from Congo, you know, from different developing countries, it's really good to understand how we can use certain policy tools in order to help them achieve those inter you know whatever interests they have so in particular i'm thinking mm -hmm. mineral producers want value addition in processing um, that's an obvious kind of policy it, it's a it's, it's a policy opportunity for us to think about collectively how can partnerships be developed in order for us to help cleaner you know for example uh, green steel projects or um, reducing the carbon footprint of mineral of mining activities. Okay. These are specific um, initiatives where you can use policy, you can incentivize business, you can set standards in order for mining to be done better. Um, and, and I think that has long-term consequences in terms of just basically having a good understanding of um, the interdependencies that are taking place in these supply chains. The other point, I guess, is that critical mineral space is a good lens to understand long-standing relationships mm -hmm. and how they can be consolidated, how they fall apart. And I mean, we've been having all these, these conversations around, you know, what does the U.S. want to do when it comes to Japan and Korea? Because Korean companies' comparative advantage is in the midstream and the downstream sector. So we don't want Korean companies to be competing. Instead, we want them to be participating in the supply chain, expanding the market, being able to supply, not just for US and China markets, but also for the developing countries, which need to also undertake their own clean energy strategy. So it's a huge market. It's very complex. But I think there are ways in which policy can help facilitate more partnership. But the starting point there is to have to kind of reset the view and, f and, and, and tame down a little bit the, the discussion on competition and look for more opportunities in which we can understand better 
what are the different needs and how can we meet them so that you know whatever the US interest is it it goes together with the interests of the South Korea of Japan of African countries who want these minerals extracted for developmental purposes. Great. Thanks, Virgil. Yeah. Kind of want to ask you a question, maybe have us talk a moment about um, kind of the the good governance around mining. And and that, you know, in the in the mineral security partnership, you know, there's there's it does talk about how you want to pro promote transparency and environmental and social good governance. And I, I, there was, I don't know if you saw, there was, there was a really interesting op-ed by a guy at CSIS, Christian Buyamungu. I don't know if you saw that one. It was, it was, it was, very, it was very eloquent, and it's a good read, because saying that, and, it, and I think that I almost want to substitute not just what the Minerals Security Partnership is talking about, but even about the greening BRI initiatives, mm -hmm. wanting to make sure that, that as, you know, as, as this partnership and even the Chinese come in to, like, bring in the good governance, that it shouldn't be seen as, as a way that, that each of them gets good access from, from, mm. from, from Africa for, for these minerals. And that mm. I, I think that he's saying, and I've seen it in other places, that you know, if the US and others, and even the Chinese, if you're going to bring governance, good governance, we want you to stay. Mm. And, that, and so I was just kind of curious about, you know, because I know it's no, so new, and it's not trying to put you on this, the spot, because I'll, I'll, I've got some pretty you know, things to say about China's greening the BRI that aren't too glowing. but. What is it in, in this partnership? How, how can we kind of lock in that this will be long term and, and doing some of the things too that, that Jojo is talking about that, I mean, in Africa and in other global South countries, they don't just want to be the miners, right? But so I will be quiet now. Just no, to, I, to think this is, I think this is probably the most important part of, of this conversation, right? Because we're talking about diversity, good standards, transparency. Well, how do you do it, right? And that's, that's a big piece of this. And um, our efforts with the Partnership for Global Infrastructure Investment and the Mineral Security Partnership is really trying to tackle that thoughtfully and carefully, right? Because what we need to do is work to encourage the best class investments to uphold standards without trying to rewrite the rule book on their behalf. Because at the end of the day, we're governments talking about these issues. We are not the miners. We're not the community advocates. We are not in a position to define the elements of what social license to operate is, but we certainly can help infuse them. And you know how we've been talking about this is that there's a couple ways that we can help move that forward. So from a more traditional foreign policy perspective, um, we're doing things like with the MSP on the margins of our last meeting that we had in Cape Town at the Indaba, we released top level policy principles on ESG and good governance standards with our African partners in the room, discussing them, hashing them out, and actually thinking about how they would be applied. And that's one piece of that. We also have been really working through the G7, the OECD, and even on the margins of COP15, the Biodiversity COP, to release our views, our top level principles, our, our requirements at the highest policy levels of the types of considerations that we need to, to, to see, including that Sustainable Mining Alliance, I'm sure some of you are, are tracking that came out of the COP15 conversation. But that's, that's policy, that's signaling, right? Mm -hmm. um, so how do you bring that into the actual investments? And also at the Indaba, something that um, I thought my, my, my current boss really put eloquently is that really every group of us have a piece to pay, play. So for the US and our partners and allies, it is incumbent on us as we are saying that we want to help producing countries in Africa or South America bring better governance along, that we meet that with really kind of two sets of tools, the capacity tools to actually develop the enabling environment that helps bring and attract that investment. And that's something that I've had the pleasure of managing or help manage at the State Department for the last three or four years, where we've put about $30 million, and that's certainly still a small number, um, into our capacity development work focused on helping countries rewrite their mining codes on how to actually do social consultations. Of course, once again, not us, but we have invested <laughs> in others um, coming out, whether that's CLDP or, or other experts. Mm -hmm. These are the requests we're receiving from those governments. That's the long-term investment, right? In the short term, we also need to use our limited public tools, and that's why we're doing so much of this work, not just in the US, but in form formulations of G7 partners that share and align these, these top-level policy principles 
to ensure that we're directing our limited public dollars in ways that de-risk investments that could be meaningful and transformative for these countries. Because at the end of the day, none of these projects are going to be successful if the local communities aren't served. And if workers are going home to houses that don't have electricity or clean water, and there aren't schools for the, for children to be in in those communities opposed to, to in mine sites, we're not doing our job. We're not offering that better value proposition. Um, another way that we're looking at that that maybe is a little bit more direct um, is through PGII, we're thinking about how different discrete engagements can really add an additive value. Um, so as we've been doing work in the DRC and in Angola, we've been supporting efforts around the libido corridor and the opportunity to help expand the rail that connects to the, the port in Angola back to the mining communities and working with representatives from those governments on different ways that we can add additional value add, whether over time we're able to support bi-directional trade and have spurs that help support agricultural development, that um, there are more diverse investments on the front end in the mining sector that helps push that, that better governance. Now, this is aspirational, but it starts with a handful of discrete engagements. It starts from having these types of conversations. And I would argue it even starts with those policy principles that sometimes we get beat up on because they don't seem practical and tangible. But this is how you start <laughs> operationalizing it. And it's a long game. And you have to stay committed over the long haul to be able to do that. And I think what's been really interesting about this policy issue is I started my work in the previous administration thinking about this. That's how we started up our enabling environment work. Now we're so super supercharged uh, to make sure it all gets done. I think this is one of those policy areas that I hope will continue to find bipartisan support. And so we're able to really continue the momentum um, and keep our footprint firmly on the ground in, in the countries that we're talking about. Sorry, that was a very long-winded no, response. Was awesome. but we were like <laughs> no, that was great, and that was that was my that was the last question I was going to ask. So oh, I didn't perfect. Even you had no, that. <laughs> <laughs> you're a good team. It's good. Um, so I think what we'll do is open it up to Q and A with the audience now, um, and we're going to start in the room. So I'm going to ask you to go ahead and raise your hand if you have a question, uh, and then we'll go to a handful of questions from online, and then we'll come back to the room. So we're going to go back and forth a couple times, um, and Anne and Jennifer have the mics. Um, and why don't we start right there with that gentleman. Hi there, uh, thank you. Uh, and if you'll, sorry, if you'll introduce yourself um, before getting to your question. Absolutely, right? yes. Uh, Harris Fontaine, I work at KRL International. Um, so my question is uh, maybe a little bit outside of the scope of critical minerals, but it's very related. Um, you know, as the US looks to increase investments in infrastructure both at home and abroad, uh, like with PGII, um, you know, materials such as green steel seem to become a much more increasingly important resource that, um, that will need to be used to meet those commitments while also decarbonizing the global economy. And I, but the, the problem is though that, you know, iron, the, the key element in that, isn't considered a critical mineral. Um, and so it, it appears almost as if maybe, um, there isn't as much momentum in securing those kinds of supply chains, which are also a competitive um, mining um, industry uh, when it comes to you know, global competitors like China. So how would you say that maybe US priorities are when it comes to iron, green steel? Um, you know, what, how exactly would that maybe align with the critical minerals policy that you spoke about today? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we can take one or two more questions. Up here in the front, there's two here, so we'll just do both, both of those. Thank you. My name is Boka Cham. I work for Tetra Tech. And my question is really to echo what Helena and Jojo did, said about, and even Jennifer, actually, on good governance in some of these uh, uh, producing countries, actually. Uh, I am originally from Guinea, and uh, uh, some of you may know that. You know, we have the, the, th the two-thirds of the bauxite uh, reserve of the globe. Bauxite is used to, to, to be refined and produce aluminum also. So there are some U.S. companies out there in Guinea, 
and there are Chinese actually, so the competition is becoming pretty high actually in terms of access to these resources. And uh, what we are seeing now is uh, right now we don't have a democratically elected government in place, but the hunter who is out there is really pushing pretty hard uh, to ask these mining companies to respect what was written in their, in their convention actually, which was really to build refineries actually. There is, there, uh, there is a joint venture out there between some U.S. companies and European companies out there. They have been mining bauxite since the 70s, actually. Uh, if they had, they have, like, in their, com I mean, their original contract that they have to build a refinery. So now it's, it's a huge debate out there. And co communities in these places, to be honest with you guys, uh, I know the places because I've worked out there. I've even worked for some of those mining companies from the U.S., I mean, they're the poorest, actually, in the country, actually. Say that again, sir. They are the poorest, actually, in okay. some of these communities. So how to address that? I think, I mean, what you're saying is very interesting to hear that, you know, we're trying to think about how to make sure that we yeah. get more engaged and promote good governance in some of these places because they want development, actually. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Pass it right over. Thanks. Hi, I'm Sarah Schoenhart from e, &E News. Um, the U.S. and EU have been talking about coming to some sort of agreement. Sorry, this is probably for Helena. Um, uh, on critical minerals, uh, I think we're expecting some type of announcement tomorrow. Can you address what a critical minerals agreement, a bilateral agreement, would look like and how that might be different from the Mineral Security Partnership, of which the EU is also a member? Thanks, Sarah. Okay, so we have um, a question on sort of how do you determine a critical mineral? Okay, um, so Corey can take that one on. Thank you, Corey. Um, any more comments on good governance? And I would actually, um, we had a, a session on how do we do better? Um, uh, when was that? In October, that I would, I'll, I'll make sure that you get the link to that event because I think it'll res sort of be responsive to some of your comments as well. Um, and then Helena putting you on the spot that we can, you just whatever you can share um, with, a, with an understanding that you are limited in what you can share <laughs> the day before an announcement. Um, and then we'll go to you, Abby, in just a minute for the online questions. Okay, Corey, why don't you go ahead? Right. It's, it's a great question. And honestly, I think there should be more public discourse and transparency around how the critical mineralists, or in European case, uh, I just want to make sure I get the strategic critical um, um, uh, materials in China, it's translated directly as strategic key minerals, um, the different lists for different purposes. Something not being on the list does not mean it's not vitally important. Uh, a large part of the list is a signaling um, both publicly and internally to policymakers and throughout the bureaucracies in question that these things are both important and we need to pay special attention to securing them. Um, and, you know, I actually would like to use the chance to address you know, the pro and con of having critical minerals as a thing, as a concept. I have, I, you know, I talk a lot with clients uh, in, in kind of the resource space. You know, we can't talk about rare earths. We need to talk about lanthanum. We need to talk about praseodymium or neodymium, whatever you're working on, because there's specific things with specific applications that come from different places with different processing. You talked about uh, the difficulty of the supply chain. Some of these have hundreds of chemical process steps. And the talent side, it's not just developing the, the project, you know, I'm sure you're dealing with, how do you develop the talent to know how to do this stuff? So anyway, all of that's baked in. Iron ore is not, uh, forgive me, iron ore uh, industry folks, as complicated. <laughs> uh, certainly there are complications in a lot of processes, but it's not the same kind of beast and certainly not the same, um, I'd say novelty, these are mature processes, but in terms of kind of global capacity to do these things. Um, so on one hand, there's a benefit of grouping everything as critical minerals. One of the benefits is it drags up in, in awareness and priority certain things that you might not know about or that policymakers might not have a particular eye on. Example, if you go out in the street right now and ask someone about lithium, why does it matter? How important is it? Why, why do we care? I'm sure you get a pretty cogent answer from most average people around here. If you go out and ask the same question about tantalum, how many people are going to give you a cogent answer? Right? For, the, for the record, fun fact of the day, it's a particular metal that's uh, is really good for uh, high capacitance, low volume uh, transistors. Uh, really important for, elect uh, for, for the electronics industry, especially high end. How many people are going around saying, you know what, today I'm gonna work on tantalum, right? So, so having that framing is really important for elevating the status. Of course, there's also the issue of kind of washing out, um, you know, critical minerals. Oh, it's one concept and it's really right. not. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so I hope that gets some Can of I the- add uh, Yeah, of course. Thoughts in. 
Yeah, yeah I, it's a it's a great question because like the second we sat down, I wrote like on my little note, polycopper iron ore, like you know because <laughs> you know for everything Corey said is, is exactly true, um, and you can't have an endless list of critical minerals. However, like what we're learning through the models that we're applying now, have very real capabilities to rinse and repeat across the whole decarbonization agenda, and that's why I group those three, and I'm probably leaving a few out and making someone mad somewhere, um, but that are really active. And in the application of green steel, I think you've seen uh, our administration, the international community, really try to send really strong demand signals for the steel to kind of push back to the iron ore and, and, and pellet making process. And so while it may not be as quite a complicated supply chain, we understand that there needs to be a demand signal for the end products, and we're seeing actually a lot of interesting partnerships and announcements and, and groupings of um, folks coming together to really accelerate that industry. And um, we'll continue to use things like the First Movers Coalition and other groups to, to send that kind of, you know, really strong signal. Okay, thanks. Is there anything, Jennifer, Jojo, you guys want to comment on what makes a okay. <laughs> okay. I could comment a little bit on the, the good governance yes, question. So I think we need to think of good governance in kind of two dimensions. One is how at the domestic level and what can be done by stakeholders within that particular um, you know, community or, or state. And then you have the international level, which is where we have more sort of um, involvement because this is about trade rules, this is about what's acceptable under um, WTO, et cetera. Um, there's a... So my work, I, I work as, um, I consider myself as a political economist in development studies. And one of the most important things that we always look at when we do reforms is whatever reform you put in place, there has to be an ownership of that reform. So if it's about setting up, you know, anti-corruption policies, for example, not just in the mining industry, but elsewhere, you know, across the board, that needs to be a process that takes on board the different stakeholders that needs to be acceptable to the community and to, to everyone else. And then, of course, you have specific policies in the mining industry where they're directly impacted by trade rules. So, for example, with industrial policy, value addition, um, you know, building refineries, all these things, they could be subject to certain rules that may or may, may, or may not be against specific international rules. So a good example would be the, the current ban on the export of nickel raw materials in Indonesia. This was a, pretty much, it was, a, uh, it, was a, it was a policy that was fought it, moving forward in order to increase domestic capacity of nickel processing in Indonesia. And that's been relatively successful in terms of bringing in foreign investment in the country. Um, so this kind of policy would have required some kind of consent or some, some form of support outside because no one wants a ban on, on, on raw materials and then you don't know what's going to happen in the, supplies, in the supply chain, right? So mo quite complex, but I think you can kind of think of it in those terms. Thank you, Chicho. Can I say Sure. To, but so, um, so let's talk about greening the BRI. That ecosystem is very diverse. We've got the Xi Jinping top down. That's where you guys kind of hang out a lot in Beijing, right? So of course, <laughs> there's been say they want to green it. They've been getting a lot of bad press. You know, they did say they're not going to invest. I mean, that's not critical minerals, but they're not going to invest anymore in, in coal-fired power plants overseas. But the more, kind of for me, the more interesting side, and people who I've had come talk over the years, are the people at the bottom up. Everything from Zhang Jingjing, the environmental lawyer who tromps around in uh, Latin America and, and the African continent, helping communities to sue Chinese companies in Chinese courts for violations, and particularly in mining. I don't think it's yet been critical minerals, but, you know, I mean, but she's not just a one-woman show because she's partnering with a lot of different organizations. And I think she was also involved in helping the, and I was too, a little bit, the Asia Society has a, their policy institute. They just came out and they spoke for me a few weeks ago about this digital toolkit for Belt and Road host countries, for the people to figure out, like, well, when, well, what are, what, when we say due diligence, what does that mean? And so it, it sounds like it is. It's a toolkit. And it's, so far it's in, I think it's in, Bahasa Indonesian, Lao, in Chinese, and a couple other, well, English too, of course. And so it's a little bit of a how-to, and so it's, it's a tool that, that environmental groups that are on the ground, some of them international and you know the, the local country, so they can help guide communities 
I guess in long and short, you know, how to protect yourself from Chinese investment. But it could help for other countries' investment too. These are yeah. standard things. And la last comment is that um, it's also in Chinese. And I mean, because of COVID, the Asian society folks couldn't go to China, but I think they will because there's a lot of hunger in China. Like, how do we do this? And also, like Henry said, critical minerals, it's not just a thing. BRI is also not oh, yeah. just a thing. It's complicated. So I'll stop there. Thanks, Jennifer. Helena. <laughs> sure. I will answer this to the best of my abilities right now. And I know there's been a lot of attention on the IRA's Section 30D clean vehicle tax credit um, and the administration's interpretation of what an FTA is. And as many of you know, Treasury's December 29th guidance did leave some openness on the interpretation of what an FTA would be for 30D eligibility. And this is something that the White House has been actively engaging on with several partners. Um, and at the end of the day, the most I can say now, so you know, my White House and Treasury colleagues uh, don't get too mad at me, um, is that it is going to be incredibly important bilaterally and multilaterally for us to work together with both our partners that are demand and supply um, countries. And I think there is an increasingly deepening interest in ensuring that um, we have pathways to do this work together. And you saw that with the early days with, like I said, some of the initial announcements we've made through the G7 and Mineral Security Partnership. So with that, all I can say is just you know more to come. Great, thank you, Helena. Abby, why don't you go ahead and share some of the questions from online? Okay, great. Thank you, Lauren, and thank you to all of our speakers um, for your insightful remarks on such a complex and timely topic. Um, we have a robust audience tuning in <laughs> online, and the questions have been pouring in, so I'll try my best to group them. Um, starting with looking at developing countries, Benjamin Wilson of the Fund for Peace asks, what measures do we need to take to empower and protect the rights of those living in mineral-rich developing countries as more critical minerals are being mined in their home countries? How can we partner with critical minerals uh, producing countries to ensure a sustainable and fair global supply chain? And before I open that up, a couple of others asked specifically about Africa um, and its geopolitical importance, mm -hmm. as well as the small Pacific Island countries. That's a big one. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you. That's helpful. Well, actually, I think, so I mean, I think the, the sort of developing country context, I think we covered um, to, I'm, I'm watching time, so I'm not trying to minimize the importance of these issues. I'm trying to cover as much ground as we can. So, but, but I think thinking about the importance of, uh, we've talked a lot about the U.S. and China, but Africa is a major player in this, um, and so is Latin America. And so maybe we can think about um, the sort of the, the, how those regions sit in this geopolitical map when it comes to critical minerals. Who wants to start? <laughs> <laughs> I guess me. Um, <laughs> so, you know, the, so many countries in the continent of Africa have an opportunity you're usually not afforded to have again. And so I think, you know, going back to kind of where we started this conversation just around the geopolitics, around energy in general, yeah. um, many of these countries remember their story and their narrative of um, having challenges developing their oil and gas resources. And now so many, especially the countries that really fill the copper and um, cobalt belt, have an opportunity to play uh, a really meaningful role in the transition. And so I, I have to go back to my remarks that I, I shared earlier. Um, you know, it's not lip service when we say that, you know, we have our role, the countries that have these resources have a role, and the private sector have a role, and what we're trying to do is facilitate those, those relationships and um, have those conversations in a meaningful way with our African partners. I've spent probably three, four weeks over the last six months visiting my colleagues in different parts of the continent, having these types of conversations. And I think there's a real understanding that with political will, there's an opportunity for these countries to develop these resources in a way that's meaningful for their economies, for their people, um, and that can bring more diverse investment, which only benefits them and the global community. Um, and we're seeing some of those reform agendas happen right now. You know, the government of the DRC has been reforming its uh, state-owned uh, mining company. 
that manages uh, the cobalt and, and copper resources. We're seeing countries think through having more open and competitive tenders and for moving forward their permitting rights for new lithium projects, which are being discovered and explored all across the continent. And so I think it's, it's a cautiously optimistic moment. And if we um, really continue to kind of follow through, and that, that goes to our partners as well, there's a real opportunity for, for governments on that continent and, and the people um, that live in those countries. Thanks, Lena. And yeah, I just the the point about energy, I think, is really important. The you know Jack Goldstone wrote a piece for us a couple a year or two ago now that um, highlighted the energy energy deficit on the continent of, of Africa, right? And the and at the same time, a rapidly growing population, and the fact that we need to have these sort of meaningful and intentional partnerships with countries uh, in the region in order to make sh to, to sort of support their their energy needs, right? in ways that ideally don't undermine sort of global climate goals. And so, but that is gonna require that real meaningful engagement at, from the local level up into the national and international. And so how do we, how do we create those um, opportunities? Um, Corey, go ahead. Uh, let's, um, there's so much to unpack here and it's, it's obviously not enough time. I really appreciate everything there. And I just wanna add um, a couple you know, concerns, I think uh, in terms of framing and how we think again, back to the structural drivers piece is you know it is the nature of every government to represent its strategy in the world stage and the other side of this is beliefs about a country strategy so if you're a resource producing country and you're looking for your own economic development pathway do you believe um how do you believe you fit into the other country strategy there is one there always is um so with china you know you see a lot of historically cases and some of the uh, the more problematic cases of chinese investment in the african continent um come down to a certain company had a, a lot of money to make and local stakeholders like this sounds good you know and, and that might be bad for certain stakeholders that is that is a transaction in other cases we have the u.s or other actors trying to say and come and say hey we have a values proposition do you believe that you're going to get that mm -hmm. versus do you believe the amount of money you might get from a higher tender or from a higher bid from a chinese mining investor um, that is a, a real practical calculation and so i think that it's, the strategy is one end, but it's, it's belief, it's confidence in the partner you're trying to work with. It's do you trust um, the particular Chinese actor, or if you believe it's acting on behalf of the government, um, and it, same with the US. So I think one of the things that's is so valuable and so important is that consistent messaging that you know, the US in particular, for example, means to be a long-term supportive partner. That is critical to make that a um, believable and trustworthy message that holds over time, because without that, the partnerships can't hold. Um, so a concern, but I'm really glad things are moving in the right direction. Great. Georgia, do you want to comment on sort of the Latin America, like the South America context in this regard? I mean, I think as min most of the mineral producers, they often have, the way I think of it is you have a basket and then you can choose which, um, which kind of policy you want to implement. So recently, for example, the biggest, I think the biggest policy tool has been FPIC, free prior and informed consent. And you now have 10 years after a whole sort of debate whether that was such a useful exercise in empowering the indigenous communities and those who have been impacted by uh, mining activities. Um, so I think we do have all these different, um, different types of tools that are present. I wanna go back to the point about these tools need to have some sense of ownership and acceptance by the communities, by the businesses. And ultimately, we need to really think about what, going back to Corey's point, you know, what, what, how does this all fit to the general development strategy of countries? Um, and that the role of the international community there is to kind of be a watcher and to see how it unfolds and stepped in in situations where we think, okay, it's not going in the right direction. Mm -hmm. So for example, again, going back to the point on the processing ban or, of, of nickel, um, it's gonna be bad for foreign companies because they have to pay more. You know, They have to set up refining plants. But if the Indonesian government argues, well, this is good for local community, this is good for employment, I think we need to kind of think about that balance. You know, Is it profit versus long-term sustainable acceptance of mining in Indonesia. And this is gonna be a decision that will be replicated and will be repeated in many places where there are critical minerals. So we need to be prepared. We need to know how to basically make the judgment between the trade-offs. 
which leads me to the final point. Um, we want to talk about sustainable mining, but I think we need to come to accept that there is no such a thing as a cost-free mining. Right. When you stop a mining project in Sweden, it necessarily implies that it needs to be done somewhere else because the demand is accelerating. That is not to say that we should do mining all the time, but we need to think that every decision that's taking place in one place is consequential to developing countries. Mm -hmm. And if it's not happening in places like Sweden or North Carolina, it's going to happen in somewhere else where the social and regulatory, the, the, the socioeconomic regulatory frameworks are probably weaker, environmental licensing are not as effective. And so we're making trade-offs in policy choices as we decide on whether one mining project goes forward or not. Thank you, Jojo. I think we have time for one more question. We can have, take it from this gentleman at the, at the front. Jennifer, do you have the, or no, Abby, you have the mic right there. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, hi, Eric Miller, uh, Rita Potomac Strategy Group and an advisor on critical minerals. I wanted to raise the question of the shallow market problem. So part of the issue here is that a lot of these materials are not fully and free to, freely traded in abundance. So. And if you're China, concentration matters greatly. So if you control, say, uh, the three most important mines producing cesium in the world, which is crucial for light vision goggles, or you control refining for 80% of the world's cobalt, if you're not China, how do you deal with the problem of expanding your relative supply and things particularly important for military applications? and to deal with the fact that you're often hundreds of millions of dollars in an incredibly shallow, uh, often monopolistic or quasi-monopolistic controlled market where prices can move wildly. I mean, it's a long-term game and a very hard proposition. Phenomenally said, absolutely. I assume this is. Yeah, yeah so. no, please go ahead. You, <clears throat> I think you answered yes. your you question. Answered <laughs> yeah. Um, is there anything, yeah. Is there anything yeah. else? No, absolutely. What's the role for policy? What's the yeah. role for policy? Absolutely. I, th I think, you know, Jojo is really captured previously. It's governments need to have both domestically, internally, and internationally a clear set of trade-offs, what they are and are not willing to make. One of the trade-offs in this case would be how much are you willing to spend uh, for what is in a technical global economic sense uh, excess capacity. Um, but it's a different source. There's a value. There's presumably some implicit economic value there. Are you willing to pay it? Um, defense industry generally probably probably willing to pay certain types of that, um, but it's also a long payback period. It's an indirect payback in terms of you're not going to build a cesium plant in North Carolina, say, that's going to make money on its own in the way a typical project finance uh, structure would would hold. Right? This isn't this isn't the same kind of game. Um, so I think one hand is just the kind of strategic you know trade-offs what he's willing to make. The other is, frankly, a different financial uh, perception of it. Are you dealing with project finance, or are you linking projects in such a cesium is part of a longer-term payback, of a, of a broader type of payback? I think that's critical. It's not something that we typically do outside of China. I'm not even sure, frankly, if China really does that. I think it's happened into a lot of uh, um, mutually beneficial supply chains and segments of the market, but I'm not sure how um, kind of closely that was managed, but that's where it is right now. Um, so yeah, trade-offs and then reconsidering where the costs lie and how much you're willing to absorb them in which ways, personally. Okay. Okay. We are at the end of our time, so I want to give you each an opportunity if, if there's like a one last burning thing that you want to share um, today and then, and then we'll go ahead and close out. Okay. You're Jennifer, you're good. I'm okay, good. Corey? Get in touch. We love talking about this stuff. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Get in touch with me too. <laughs> yeah, same. Okay. <laughs> I guess Helena's yeah. really <laughs> Helena's really busy. <laughs> really busy yeah. I'll find someone for you to speak to. Don't yeah. worry. That's fair. Okay. I want to thank you all for being with us today, um, and thank you to those of you watching online. Um, this is, you know, all of these events. It always looks like, oh, we just get up on the stage and it's done. Um, but there's actually a lot of work that goes into them. And so I want to thank the ECSP team, um, Abby and Claire Doyle and. Um, Angus Soderberg and then uh, also Sharon Burke and, and Claire Doyle have been really leading a lot of the research on ECSP's behalf. So thank you to both of them. Um, to all of our Wilson Center colleagues who have helped co-sponsor to the event, the event, to our AV team who makes all of this possible. 
Um, I also want to flag that there's a lot of work going on at the Wilson Center. I, you guys are all trying to like leave, and I'm just going to keep going. But there's a lot of work going on at the Wilson Center on critical minerals. ECSP has a, a sort of robust body, but there's a lot of our regional programs are doing regionally specific work. And so um, I encourage you to look at our critical minerals topics page on the website to find all of that. And of course, the event will be recorded and archived on the website, so you can come back and watch it again. And thank you very much, and we'll, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.